And if you wouldn't mind, take out your sermon notes that we provided in your service guide so that you can follow along with the message. Or if you uh, want to follow along on your cell phones, you can do that by using the YouVersion app. Today we begin our new series called Humble Pie, all right? And uh, in our preparation for this series, I did some research, and I think all of you will, will be beneficiaries of this, where I, I actually studied pie, all right? And some of you are like, I'm looking at you right now. You've done a lot more than study the pie, PC. You've done a lot of research development and on-the-job training, and you would be right. Uh, but uh, I was researching. How many, uh, uh, throw it out what your, what your guess is. What do you think America's favorite pie is? Apple. Apple, it is hands down, is overwhelming. Even more so, pizza pie. Is, uh, it's even more popular than pizza pie. And I think that must be like a northern thing where you call a pizza a pie, where I'm like, Dude, it's a pizza. I don't know. I mean, you want to call it pie, whatever you want. Uh, but yeah, apple is, uh, is by far the most uh, popular uh, pie. So also, we took a little bit of your tithe money today. And everyone, uh, as you leave, you will be given your own little miniature apple pie with our logo on that, uh, just to let you know how much we love and appreciate you. All right? So... Oh, man, it is. Yeah, don't mention it. It was really, really my pleasure. But no, uh, so uh, some of us, uh, as we begin this series, we're doing a series on humility, all right? And can y'all believe we have, uh, that the year, uh, we've only got like four, less than four months left in the year. And we decided in January, we said, we're going to spend this whole year talking about doctrine, and so we've been talking about doctrine, and we've really covered our four essential beliefs here at Coastal. You don't have to believe that to attend our church, but these are the four things that all of our members uh, decided that we're going to agree on to become members. And, uh, and we have addressed these. We've got uh, these things in the lobby. We've got, it says Coastal Beliefs. And you can also go on our website. Four essential doctrines that we hold to here at our church. The first one is this. The Bible is the Word of God. God's word is the only completely reliable and truthful authority, and we accept it as our manual for decision-making, all right? So anytime we're faced with a major decision, our first question is this, what does the Bible say? It always goes back to the Bible. It is our outline for faith and practice. We practice daily Bible reading and study because the Bible is the basis for all we believe. Can I get a little bitty amen? amen. Second thing that we all hold to, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the second person of the Trinity. He lived a sinless life. He voluntarily gave his life for us. He rose from the dead. People receive salvation through him alone. He baptizes believers in the Holy Ghost, and he is coming back. Now, come on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Yes, all right. The third is we must be born again. It doesn't just mean all of a sudden I, my thinking started changing. I had a, I had a, I, God changed my mind, but before God changed my mind, he got to change our heart. Okay, we recognize that we're sinners. We have fallen short of God's plan for our lives. We've asked for God's forgiveness and restoration, and we seek his leading and guidance for all of our life. And the final thing of the coastal beliefs is that all believers can be filled with the Holy Spirit. We believe the only way possible to live the Christian life is by God's power within us. Every believer can be filled with the Holy Spirit simply by asking. We practice a daily dependence on God's Spirit to enable us to do what's right, okay? And so where we've covered these things in detail for the last eight months, okay, and now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be spending the rest of the year learning how to put into practice what we've spent the last eight months learning. And where, uh, how many of y'all have, have known somebody? Maybe you're, you, you don't have to raise your hand and say, that's me. You ever know anybody that's like stuck? Maybe they're stuck professionally. They're like, man, everything's kind of, everything's kind of plateaued right now. Maybe, so, maybe you may be stuck with uh, your family relationships. Or maybe you're like stuck emotionally. You're like, yeah, I'm just kind of in a bad place. Can I tell you, the Bible shows us how we become unstuck is whenever you and I adopt an attitude of humility. And so we're going to be spending all of, all of uh, September studying this topic of humility. Can I let you know, there's not a lot of sermons on this topic. My wife and I, uh, a couple of years ago, we were adding up all the, uh, all the time that we spent in Bible college and all the time we spent in church and everything. And like within, uh, I, I think within like 10 years, we said, we've heard like 15,000 sermons. I cannot recall one sermon on the topic of humility. 
And as I'm researching, I'm like, okay, what are, what are the great guys talking about? I'm, I'm researching like all the big churches. Yeah, ain't, no, ain't nobody got no series on humility. Can I tell you why I believe that's the case? It's because there's a pressure as a pastor to not talk about a subject that we haven't mastered just yet. But as we begin to study this topic of humility, nobody masters this, this side of heaven. All right? We can get better and better and better. But... Um, so I'm like, okay, the Lord, show me how to be able to do this. So as I was, as I was talking about it, I kept feeling the Holy Spirit telling me, hey, let's, let's talk about humility. Talk about humility. And I'm like, okay, how do I teach it? Do I teach it? Do I, do I start talking about pride and then teach about humility? And then in my research, watch this. We learn that there are 58 verses in the scriptures on pride. But there are 73 verses on humility. Which leads us to conclude this. Watch. If you and I can develop humility in our life, then you and I can defeat pride. Okay? So let me show you what I'm talking about. Look, let's look at some of the verses on humility. It says this. Wisdom, instruction is to fear the Lord. And humility comes before honor. You see the exact same thing repeated in, uh, in, uh, in th just three chapters away. And it says this, before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. Proverbs 22, 4 says, humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. Jesus was talking to uh, some folks in Luke chapter 18. He says this. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And then Peter was talking to him in 1 Peter 5, and he says this, Clothe yourself with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Okay, So God wants to prosper and promote us. Are we all agreed on that? But before he can do that, we have to learn this attitude of humility. And if you and I will learn to eat humble pie early on, guess what? We later, later on, we learn, you know what? This is pretty good. It goes down hard the first couple of times. But it, it, later on, you're like, you know what? It's, I, I like what this is producing, you know? And so I, uh, I learned about humility, and I'm continually learning about humility, that, you know what, the sooner we begin to adopt it, the sooner we begin to prosper, and the sooner we begin to walk in everything God has for us, all right? I used to think when I was, uh, I was younger, and especially younger in the Lord, I thought humility meant you couldn't hardly look nobody in the eye. Well, that's not humility. That's just being shy, all right, or bashful, or, or you're walking around, well, I'm just old, dirty old dog. I, why, why would God ever want to use me? That's not humility, all right? That, that's a whole different set of issues right there, all right? Today, we're going to talk about, over the next couple of months, we're going to, uh, next couple of weeks, we're going to be defining what the Bible says about humility. But today, here's our big idea. The first thing that we are going to learn about humility today is humility means, number one, write this down, it means that we are teachable, Okay? Proverbs 1 5 says this let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. Okay? You know, uh, not too long ago, I was, uh, I was in the gym. Those are, uh, a lot of you guys, uh, we all work out at the same place, and you're like, man, Chad's, I, I, I'm in the gym pretty regularly. And there was this guy that uh, was talking to me, he was a trainer there, and he goes, Chad, you are here all the time. And I, I was starting to feel pretty good about it. So, yeah, I've always kind of been a gym rat, you know. And he's like, man, you're incredibly strong. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a 400-plus bencher, you know, uh, used to squat close to 500. You know, I just kind of, you know, I kind of do high reps and everything now. And he's like, and, bro, when you get on that bike, you attack that bike. And I was like, yeah, I like, I like to get a good sweat going on. And all of a sudden, he looks at my stomach. He said, can I say something to you without hurting your feelings? I was like, I see where your eyes are, and you're already hurting my feelings. But yes, please, tell me what's going through your mind as you stare at my stomach. And he goes, let me just tell you something about getting in shape. You can't out-train a bad diet. I went, oh, that's good. Because how many of y'all y'all like to, to exercise and then eat whatever the stink you want? I'm like... 
dude, I did 20 miles on the bike today. I'm going to eat four pieces of pie and, and, and my own like small, uh, small pizza and stuff like that. So, so now I'm, I've got this nutritionist. And he said, we're going to keep your calories low. And he said, here's what I recommend for a little while. Stay out of the gym. I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, because your calories are so low. Only thing a workout's going to do is make you like stupid hungry. I'm like, okay. And here's the thing that I've learned about that, that you can't out-train a bad diet. You know what? It's not just physically. That's, that's life. What we're taking in on a frequent basis is what, this is what we become, all right? And so, you know, I, I learned I can't out-train a bad diet. What am, I, what am I putting in my mind? What am I putting in my spirit? I, some of us that grew up in the 90s, you're going to love this particular story, okay? In, the, in April of 1983, there is a young musician who was asked to play lead guitar in an up-and-coming band. The, the young guitarist's name was Kirk Hammett. And the, the, the band name, maybe a few of you have heard of it. The band's name, they're a little up-and-coming group called Metallica, all right? And so uh, there are some teenagers that are like, uh, my what? I was like, you know, if you go into the, into the museums, you can see you know, uh, some of what we're talking about. We used to have tapes. In this, completely different story. But this guy makes it in this up-and-coming. He's playing in front of thousands of every night. But Kirk Hammett, watch this. He decided that he wasn't near the musician that he thought that he could be. I mean, he's, he's, he's kind of like in that elite 1% at this time in, in rock and roll history. So he just says, you know what, I'm going to get better. He hires another guitarist by the name of Joe Satriani. And he said, I want you to teach me. And Joe Satriani said, you're going to pay me a great big old down payment. He's like, man, I got money, baby. He throws it down there and he goes, here's how you're going to learn. We're going to have lessons every week. You're going to take lessons from me. And a lot, of, a lot of guys had hired him and they just walked away. They said, he's too, he's too hard. He's too demanding. He said, not only are we going to have lessons, you're going to have homework. And if you show up at one of my lessons and you ain't done your homework, you, might, you, know, you don't even show up. For two years, Kirk Hammett took lessons from Joe Satriani and he did homework for two years. And, and guess what? After two years... Hammock humbled himself, he did all this stuff, and he learned how to do more with fewer notes, and Metallica, as a result, went from playing in front of thousands to hundreds of thousands. They sold 125 million records. Teenagers, there's a thing called records before there's CDs or, or downloads now, okay? And watch this. Kirk Hammett was later on named Guitarist Magazine's number one, uh, number one guitarist in the world. Now, I look at this. By the way, if you ever played football, there was no greater song to get you ready to kill somebody than Metallica's Inter Sandman. If you don't like Inter Sandman, you need Jesus. You are lost. You are away from God, all right? It's the most incredible opening riff to anybody. Almost anytime I hear it, I hear the, the, the hairs on the back of my neck, I was like, oh, God, I wish I could lace them up tonight. But here's one of the things that I learned about Kirk Hammett from Metallica. He's living up what the, what the philosopher Epictetus once wrote. He said this, we can't learn if we think we already know. Top 1% wants to get better. See, God wants to use humility as a tool in our lives where we can put ourselves under somebody and we can learn to grow. The second thing that humility does, humility teaches us, well, humility, when we adopt that attitude, we, we know what we don't know. Watch this. <laughs> Romans 12, 3 says it this way. Paul's right to He says, by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. But rather think of yourself with sober judgments in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. All right? So we know what we don't know. Some of us, we love to give out. We have to learn how, to, uh, like as a coach, I got to learn to coach, but I got to learn to be coachable, right? I, 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 I'm a big reader. Some of y'all know this. And I'm a big history guy. A couple of years ago, I, wrote this, I read this book uh, called The Gatekeepers. And the subtitle of this book, if you, if you love uh, politics and stuff like this or leadership, the, the subtitle of it is, it says, The Gatekeepers, How the White House Chief of Staff Defines the Success of Every President. All right? And so I was like, oh, dude, this is totally cool. I was, I was a right-hand man at a mega church for a while. I was like, oh, this will, this will be a great leisure, uh, leisure read. What, the, what they're saying to, uh, to all of us is that overconfidence 
is an occupational hazard for incoming presidents. And can I let y'all know something? If you're the smartest person in the room, change rooms. We always want to be learning from somebody. And this, this one particular chapter, it talks about a president whose rise to fame so clouded his judgment. Watch this. He decided that he was going to be his own chief of staff. All right? And uh, I, I started, as soon as I read that, I was like, oh, he's screwed. <laughs> you know, I, I, I looked at that, and watch this. Not only he wanted to personally sign off on everything, including request to play on the White House tennis lawn. Okay? And not only did he answer every memo, teenagers, there was a thing before email that were called memos, all right? They were essentially emails that were already printed out, all right? And here's the thing. Uh, not only did he answer every memo and send it back, he would also send the memo with, that corrected the typos on the memo. Micromanager to the extreme. And here's what this particular, and I will not tell you what president it was. Unless you ask me in the lobby, and I'll tell you privately with my microphone, all right? Because, uh, if I, and I'm not going to tell you what party he was, because some of see, I told you, you can't teach nothing to the people. But anyway, the magnitude of the office of the president of the United States is so huge that to do it successfully, you have to have, you got to surround yourself with hundreds, if not thousands, of brilliant people. And as a result, this particular president was only elected to one term. And one of the speechwriters later wrote of his, of his leadership. Watch this. I, I even printed this out for you. It says this. He did not devour history for its lessons, surround himself with people who could do what he could not, or learn from others that fire was painful before he plunged his hand into the flame. You see, ladies and gentlemen, can I show you what I've had to learn the hard way? Some people can only learn from getting their heart broke or getting their tail whipped. But the Bible tells us if we're really wise, we can learn by watching other people get their tail whipped and avoid a lot of pain in our life. My older sisters were never on, in trouble and they were never on restriction. They were never grounded. Do you know why? Because they did the exact opposite of everything that I did. They said, Chad is stupid. Why in the world? He's all the time in trouble. Why in God's name? Well, I want to adopt his attitude, all right? And here's the thing that we got to learn. That whether it's a president or whether, it's a, uh, whether you're a coach or a business person, arrogance takes out the best and the brightest among us. And one of the, one of the things that feeds arrogance is when you and I get stuck in our own worlds. You know, we have to be lifelong learners, and we have to surround ourselves with great thinkers. We have to own what we don't know. Can I encourage you? A follower of Christ, you will hear this on a regular basis at this church. We read our Bibles every day, right? We can spend time with God every day. If, you don't, if you've never started that, you can go to our website and download and click on Daily Bible, where hundreds of us are reading the same verses every day. If you do it for a year, you'll read the whole Bible through in a year. It'll take about 12 minutes a day. But can I tell you this? We also need to be reading for professional development, too. Come on, teachers. I was thinking, I was thinking they're, they're, all, all the teachers are going to shout me down on this, but y'all are, are just taking it all in right now, right? You're just soaking right now. Hallelujah. But here's the thing that teenagers, I want you to write this down. Maybe even tweet this or put it on your Instagram or whatever newfangled social media is. But I want you to remember this. Never forget this. A person who refuses to read has no advantage over a person who can't. You and I are responsible for our growth. All right? We're humbling ourselves every day. We're seeking after God. But we also need to be reading for personal and professional development. Reading is painful sometimes. Can I tell you one of the things I've had to learn to develop this particular discipline? you got to sometimes learn to read boring stuff. But it'll make you better. A couple, of, uh, a couple of months ago, there were people who were like, Chad, you've got to read this book. It's all about how the brain works. And I was like, oh, bro, you lost me. My little boy likes math and science. That ain't me. I like history and English. And I'm like, man. You... And so I'm sitting there. <laughs> I'm reading this. And I was like, I'm going to read this book in a week. And I was like, uh-uh, I ain't reading this book in no week. I'm going to read this book for 30 minutes, and, and I'm going to stop after that. I mean, this is rough, rough, said the dog. I'm sitting there. I am reading this stuff. And, and, uh, but you know what? Every day, I'm like, Jesus, this is boring. And then I would bring it. There would be so, one, thing, one little paragraph in all of that book that I'd be like, dude, this, that, that, that was good. That was worth my 30 minutes of time. 
Can I let you know something? Adults, we're not stuck. We can listen to a podcast on our way to work or an audio book. Or here's the other thing. Even if you don't want to start that one, we can study successful people and just start doing what they do. All right. When, whenever I, there was a guy that, uh, that was uh, a nutritionist was talking to me, he goes, Chad, do you want the first step to, uh, uh, to learn how to eat right? I said, what? He goes, go eat where the skinny people eat. <laughs> skinny people don't hang out at buffets. <laughs> I'm like, okie dokie, you know, <laughs> this big old trough of food. You're not, you're not strong enough to handle that, all right? So here's the thing. We have to do our homework. Some people will pay thousands of dollars to go to seminars, but won't spend $20 on, the, on, on, a, on a book of the, from the same guy. All right? Or here's the other thing. They won't even listen to the free podcast. I'm like, come on, man. We got to search after wisdom, don't we? Um, in a book that I recently read, I, we keep on talking about reading, Geng, I, I discovered that Genghis Khan was one of the greatest military minds that have ever lived. You know why? History shows us he was a perpetual student. He's been depicted as a ruthless killer, but can I tell you something? Nothing could be further from the truth. When you study history, you see all of Genghis Khan's ability came from his ability, all of his victories came from his ability to absorb the best technology and practices and innovations of each new culture that he conquered. One historian wrote this. He said that Genghis Khan was the greatest conqueror the world has ever known because he was more open to learn than any other conqueror that's ever been. By working, you know, most of the times whenever uh, people would take over countries, guess what they do? They kill all the smart people. They kill all the royal family and stuff like that. Genghis Khan didn't do that. He'd go in there and he, and he asked questions. He learned about it. By the way, uh, whenever the communists took over Russia, that's what they did. They killed all the smart people. And then all, uh, you wonder how we won the arms race? Because they killed all the smart people. They, they would put potato farmers on there that couldn't hardly count, and they put them in, in charge of nuclear fission. We won because they were stupid. <laughs> Let me let you know something. By working with the scholars and the royal families of the lands that he conquered, he was able to hold on and manage territories that other countries couldn't. All right? And the final thing that we're going to learn about wisdom today is this. Humility, uh, about humility is this. It means that we have a growth mindset. Okay? Look at what Proverbs 4 says. It says this. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom. She will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom though it costs all you have. Get understanding. That growth mindset means this. I'm open to new things and, uh, and the unknown. A fixed mindset means this. I, my intelligence cannot be increased. All right? One of our staff mottos that we share at regularly at staff meeting is this. Coastal Church, we ain't know-it-alls, we're learn-it-alls. Let me let you know something about your staff pastors, okay? There ain't nobody can scout like we can. We take pride in it. We go to conferences, and we're going to know it. We're going to go there, and we're going to ask questions. They're going to think we, have got, we got ADD and just been given a, a Red Bull, all right? We ask, we're going to get better. every. And, and look, we don't go over there and, you know, <laughs> spend time crying and weeping and everything like that. We're like, hey, how much did that light cost? What, what kind of light is it? What kind of lighting system y'all you, uh, got over there? And we're taking notes all the time. Some of those things like, dude, we can, we can fix this within a month. We can do this in a month. And some are like, oh, we're going to have to save up for a while on that one. But you know what? We're going to get better. We focused our mind on that. Some of us, not anybody at this church, okay? This is the greatest church in the world, all right? But in some of the churches that I've been a part of, I've had more people come up to me and say, well, you know what, PC? You can't teach an old dog new tricks. And you know what? I have a major problem with that. Why? Newsflash, we are not dogs, okay? And so uh, as long as you and I want to win, we can grow, all right? And so we can follow Proverbs instead of old sayings that we can invest in wisdom and we can be blessed. I saw, I saw this the other day, that in a recent study by the American Resource Center, companies who hired an executive coach to help them reported that the average profit was more than seven times the cost of what they paid the executive coach. Do you know why? Because winners want to get better. People that decided, you know what, man, I want to take new ground. I want, to, I want to become something that I do not have in my natural ability to do. I'm going to be a part of the next couple of, uh, couple of months, over the next six weeks. This week, Pastor Aaron and I will sit uh, with the pastor of the largest church in America. 
And I'm going to pick his brain. He is going to think that I'm nuts. But you know what? I'm going to learn. I'm going to come back with more ideas. Guess what will happen two weeks after that? We're going to go to a church that's running over 20,000 people. I'm going to be there. I'm going to ask tons of questions. I'm going to ask everything that they got. And then uh, three, uh, two weeks after that, I'm going to the second largest church in the nation. And I'm going and I'm going to be around a uh, pastor who pastors over 50,000 people, Pastor Chris Hodges. I'm going to learn. Do you know why? Because I've only got one life to live, guys. Dear God, I'm preaching better than your amen in today. We are, the Gulf Coast is going to be saved. We're going to run more people. We're going to plant more campuses. We're going to see more people get off drugs. We're going to see more divorces stop because we're going to get better. Whenever the leader gets better, everybody gets better. The speed of the leader is the speed of the team. Recently, I, I read that in the early 80s, a group of Brazilian investors, they bought a discount retail chain in South America. And they wanted to learn more about, about retail, uh, discount retail. And they wrote 10 CEOs in America. And they said, we want to come learn from you. Only one CEO wrote them back. Guess who it was? It was Sam Walton, the largest, uh, the, uh, the, the richest one out of all of them, probably the busiest one out of all of them. And he said, yeah, I'll spend some time with you. I'll teach you everything I got. And guess what they said about Sam Walton? They said he picked them up at the airport in his red truck. And all of them threw their, <laughs> threw their, uh, their suitcases in the back of his red truck. And they sat, they all squeezed into his truck along with Sam Walton's dog, Old Roy. Some of you are like, that's a dog food. Yeah, the dog food you, own, you buy at Walmart is named after his dog. <laughs> when you're the owner of the largest company in the world, you can name stuff after your dog. But uh, they all squeeze in there, and guess where he took them? He took them to dinner at his house. And after it was over, they said, what impressed us the most about Sam Walton was, number one, guess what he did after it was over, uh, after dinner was over? He, he washed and dried the dishes. Guys, if you want to be a millionaire, wash, uh, wash and dry the dishes after, uh, after uh, your wife cooks for you. Dear God, women, I'm trying my best. But they said as he washed and dried the dishes, watch this. They said that he peppered them with questions. He was asking them, okay, so how do y'all do this over there? How do y'all do this over there? He's asking, okay, so, you know, what's the markdown on this? They said that he first sought to learn, not the other way. All right? James 3.13 calls this the gentleness of wisdom. Before we go today, Jesus showed us what we need to be like in Matthew chapter 18 whenever it talks about humility. He said, he, let me show you. It says this. At the time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he rolls his eyes here like, oh, here we go again. He called a little child among them, and he placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like the little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of the child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You know, Jesus, whenever he's talking to him, humble yourself and become like a child. Whenever he said, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? What Jesus could have said is, uh, you looking at him, partner. But instead of drawing the attention to himself, watch this. Drew, Jesus drew attention to his nature. He said, you know what? I, in, in, in Jesus' day, children were considered more like property than individuals. In their culture, you were to be seen and not heard. And Jesus is showing them in a way. Instead of trying to be a Rudy Poot that knows everything, you need to become like a child. What, what does that mean, become like a child? You know, most kids are non-threatening, aren't they? You know, I, I love that about them. If, if you're at 2 o'clock in the morning and you see a, a kid in a dark alley, you're not scared for you. You're scared for them. All right? The other thing is, they are not good at deception, are they? I love the fact that little kids will tell on themselves. Oh, dear God, Evan had, had the, had the, had the uh, cleanest conscience before. He'd come over there and say, Dad, I thought a cuss word. I'm like, it's okay as long as you didn't say it. You know, that Evan would have been a great Pharisee because he ain't never met a rule he didn't like. All right? And then they aren't really concerned with social status when they're younger, are they? You kind of have to teach them, you know, pride. Um, this year, Evan's going into the sixth grade. And I'm like, okay, you don't stink yet. But we're going to be proactive in your stinkiness. I said, you're good about taking a bath every day? You're going to start taking two. All right? You're going to take one in the morning. Dad, I don't want to do that. I said, trust me. You're not going to want to do this right now. But later on, you will not only benefit, but I'm going to, I'm going to help your dating situation. All right? <laughs> and so this summer, 
I, I went and I bought him all the, uh, to, to sew. we got to sew into what we want to grow into. And so I bought him all these, uh, these grooming products, the same stuff I use. I, I like to use Jack Black stuff. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not powerful. And I showed, uh, so I bought, I'm, dude, I spent hundreds of dollars on this boy. And I was like, I got him the good smelling hair gel and I got him uh, all the same type of stuff. I got him some body spray <laughs> and I'm like, dear God, how much is this stuff? I got him, I got him Jack Black soap and he got cologne and stuff like that. And I showed him how to be able to put enough where he, he's not Mr. Too Much Cologne Wearer because nobody likes that guy. And so the first day of school, uh, <laughs> first day of school, uh, Jennifer comes, she goes, well, how was your day? And he goes, oh, it was great. And Jennifer goes, well, did anybody tell you that you smelled good? And Evan goes, no, ma'am, but nobody told me I smelled bad, and that's just as good. <laughs> I love the transparency of kids. But the other thing that I like so much that we notice about uh, being like kids, the average four-year-old child asks 73 questions a day. And if you've got a four-year-old daughter, double it. Psychologists tell us that the reason why they're doing this is because they're curious about this world that's around them. They, uh, and, and, and they're constantly learning. God wants us to continue to humble ourselves and continue to grow as long as we're still on this planet. Before we go today, the reason why we're starting off like this, can I just tell you, some of us have been hearing the Holy Spirit speak to our heart in a particular area, and we've been ignoring it. But the longer it takes to humble ourselves the harder our hearts become. The Bible shows us in the book of Exodus that that every time Pharaoh was approached and talked to him, let my people go, he kept saying no, and guess what happened? The Bible says that heart grew harder and harder and harder. I just finished a book on how we're emotionally wired. It was so incredibly painful for me. Whenever, before we started the church, the church planning organization requires everybody to go through like a, like a meet with a counselor before you do it. Because you got to be a little bit nuts to plan a church with no people. And then uh, we know you're already crazy. We just want to make sure you're not certifiable crazy, all right? And so we were there. And the, I love the counselor because the counselors, y'all are so gifted because you just suck people right in. And they'll ask certain questions. And, and so he's talking to me. We're about a half hour into this. And Jennifer will tell you this. And, and she can't stop laughing. And he got, he's asking stuff. And we're just, we're just talking back and forth. And he goes, hey, Chad, before you go, let me ask you, who do you have that you can talk with about your feelings? And I literally started rolling up. I was like, what? Like, I, hold on a second. I don't, I don't do that. I don't talk about feelings. You know, I, t- I talk to Jesus about my feelings. And he looked at me and he goes, Chad, what, for a smart guy, what you just said is incredibly stupid. And he said, and you in one sentence have summarized why you had a heart attack at age 34. And Jennifer said, I began to sweat like a pig while this dude just emotionally read my book. And <laughs> I was like stuttering. I was so uncomfortable. He goes, hey, you may want to find somebody you can talk with, with your feelings about. And I'm, because I'm so humble and because I'm so wise, it only took me five years to, uh, to put his counsel into practice. And by the time I was there, I was so emotionally drained. Uh, I, it's, it's, a, it's a miracle that I didn't hurt myself worse. And so I learned after six months of counseling that I need to be on this lifelong journey of emotional development. And before we leave, I'm going to be incredibly vulnerable and transparent. I I realize me telling some folks like what I'm about to tell you could be, uh, uh, it could really bite me in the butt. But as I was reading this book, I learned that um, emotionally I'm I'm grieving right now. I'm on the backside of it. this year's been a, a year of a lot of loss. Um, I lost one of my mentors and one of my biggest cheerleaders and my father-in-law in May. I even lost some professional relationships. Some of my, my, my ministry buddies, they stopped talking to me, stopped inviting me to different stuff. They didn't want to hang out anymore. I was, for years, I was like chasing them. I was like, man, there used to be, we'd all do things together. And so finally, 
I, I talked with a, a, a mutual friend and I said, man, why am I getting the, the cold shoulder from everybody? Did I do something wrong? He goes, yeah, you did something wrong. Your, your church is growing. And there's it, and they don't want to have nothing to do with you. He said, that's okay because they're doing the same thing to me. I was like, but man, we grew up together. I mean, what God's doing here, I mean, he gets all the credit for it. <laughs> Anybody gets close to me, you're like, yeah, this, this is a God thing because you're an idiot. And can I also let you know, um, I've lost a few personal relationships this year. And I don't know why. These were people that I thought we were going to be friends for the rest of our life, close for the rest of our life, that shut me out and just kind of exited up my life. And it was starting to affect me. My energy level got low. And, um, and then I learned about this thing, about grieving. Can I tell you what I learned is that we as human beings are not designed to lose. And we aren't born with the skills to be able to handle our losses. The only way that we, that we learn it is it has to be learned. There's nothing inside of us. And what grief does is that it helps us to say goodbye to somebody intellectually and emotionally and place them in our memories. And a lot of times that takes time. Over time, grief will no longer dominate our thoughts anymore. It's a part of our life, and then, but it's not all of us. And this emotional development that, that I've, I've been going through, let me let you know something. It has been incredibly painful. But on the other side of our pain, church, is peace and freedom and fearlessness. And for some of us today, I don't feel like I'm the only one that's going through that. If you're experiencing some grief, you know what you need? You need to be in some relationships. Not too long ago, I had lunch with a guy. He's just a brother from another mother. And he knew something had been off. And we we're talking in the middle of lunch, man. All of a sudden, I'm just, I'm just pouring out tears. And he helped me get to the other side of it. We need each other. But it only happens when we open ourselves up and we get vulnerable and say, you know what? I'm not at my best. I need you, God. I need my brothers and sisters. I, I need to open up. And look, everybody could take advantage of you when you open yourself up. But live your life like that. It's the best way. It draws in people like a magnet. Every now and then somebody will exploit it. But you know what? Our God's bigger. And when you and I begin to humble ourselves, learn what we don't, we don't know, and continue to have that growth mindset. Yeah, it's painful sometimes. But we know what's on the other side of it. It's peace. Humility precedes honor. And what God thinks about whenever he looks at you, look at me. He's got one thing in mind whenever he looks at you, Andrew. Promotion. Sai, every time he thinks about you, how can I bless Sai more? All these different things. And when you and I commit ourselves to that inward journey, not only do we become better people, does our outlook change, but you know what? Our family gets stronger, our work gets better, and that's how the Gulf Coast will be saved. Would you stand? Let's pray. So, Father, I, I just thank you for helping me to share what was, what you put on my heart. I just ask that you continue to challenge and change us. Lord, for those of us that are stuck, may we commit ourselves to the inward journey. For those of us that you've been leading us to do certain things and maybe we've, we've, we've postponed it. Today, may we take a step toward freedom. Thank you that you love us enough to let nobody leave here the same. Same people that came in. We love you and we thank you for who you are and what you want to do in our life. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, please nobody moving. If you're here today and you've never begun your relationship with Jesus, some of you would say, you know what, I've, I've got this pulling right now. And let me tell you what that is. That's the Holy Spirit. 
That's the God that created you that wants to have a relationship with you. And you can begin that here in just a few seconds. Or maybe you want to serve God, but you've drifted and fallen away. And you're like, Chad, I'm not right with God today. I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you forward. But I don't want you to be able to go to bed tonight without knowing that you're right with God. Some of us say, Chad, I need to come home. I, I, need, I, need, to, I, I need to come back to Jesus. If that's you, if you've never begun your relationship with Christ or, or you need to begin again your relationship with Christ with nobody looking around, all I want is an opportunity to pray for you. If you'd say, Chad, I'm not right with God, would you pray for me? Would you just lift up your hand real quick? PC, pray for me. I'm not right with God. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Those of you with your hand raised, we're, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Spirit of God's moving right now. Who else? Those of you with your hands raised, here in just a second, we're all going to pray this prayer together because you're part of the family of God. But we also want you to check that box on your, on your connect card that says, I began or I recommitted my life to Jesus. This isn't the end. This is just the beginning of your relationship with Jesus. Those of you that raised your hand today, those of you watching online and in, in the cafe, let's all pray this prayer together. Dear Lord Jesus, you know I'm a sinner. And I know I'm a sinner. And I've committed sins. But today, Lord Jesus, I give you those sins. I ask you to come into my heart, wash me clean, and I'll live for you as you show me how. In Jesus' name.